All right, my friends, welcome back. And I've got a very special guest and friend on here, Nathan Kohlerman, a devoted father, transformational alchemist. And we're going to pull on that thread because I want to know so much about that. Spiritual counselor, leadership consultant, speaker, writer, minister, and co-host of the Active Intention podcast and also founder of New Intention, which is a up and coming ministry, which we were just talking about right before we uh, we hit the record button on here. But background on Nathan. So Nathan and I met, uh, we were working with a coach back in Scottsdale, Arizona, Mr. John Bowles, shout out to John Bowles. And uh, we were both in the fitness space online. We were in-person trainers and we were growing into the online space. And so this is back like 2017, 2018. And so we've had our come up like together, which is which is pretty dope. And uh, I think I got started a little bit earlier in the men's development space and you came in and started the men's development space but we're both on this spiritual journey of trying to help men wake up but nathan dude i'm so blessed to have you on the show man absolutely bro and thank you so much for having me i'm really really excited for this yeah man well give the listeners a little bit of a background a little bit more in depth on who you are yeah man so i am like you said transformational alchemist and i say that because i create spaces for people to step into different parts of themselves, to explore different parts of themselves, to remember the parts of themselves that they may have forgotten Mm -hmm. along the way. And really what I am is just doing the best that I can, right? Still fucking trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Still trying to figure it out and being able to share what I've learned, Mm -hmm. you know, with other people to help them kind of see the humility of what this journey really looks like because it's not easy and it's also a really great opportunity for us to step into greater levels of responsibility ultimately yeah man and i want to pull on that thread a little bit um, because if you think about a where your journey and my journey have, have followed a very similar arc it has really been in taking what has worked for us and then helping other people by our exact process. And so we've taken our pain, we've taken our problems, our suffering. I know you're open and honest talking about your struggles and you turn it into really a vehicle to help other people have the same breakthroughs. And that that completes that that arc, right? We need, we need certain relationships in our life as men to become the men that we are. And the greatest one I believe is the mentoring relationship where you really have to take your journey and give it to somebody else. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I would say that's that's one of the core focus you know, of my work. And I know that's with you as well, Mm -hmm. you know, to help other people who really just, they feel lost, Yeah, you know, and they're just seeking something. They're seeking a cause that's maybe greater than their own because Mm -hmm. we're in a crisis of meaning right now. Ooh, yeah. Dive deeper on that crisis of meaning. Uh, Riff on that for a second. I'm familiar. There's a a great book. Um, Oh, it's uh, Jamie wheel. What's it? Mm. I'm sure you've read it, uh, but he talks about the crisis of meaning. We're, we're in we're in really a uh, a time where we've lost a lot of traditional values from spiritual and religious standpoints, and we're redeveloping, re realizing really who we are as humans. But there is a, a deep crisis of meaning because most people have lost faith. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, you know, and, and that's a lot of what I say too. Is is people have disconnected from their devotion, mm. right? And when we are in a crisis of meaning what I perceive that to be, it's simply just a disconnection from the higher powers that be that Mm -hmm. fundamentally set the stage for the question, right? Why am I here? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. It's the who am I, right? Who am I now that this thing happened? Or who am I now that I've let this thing go? And it's a grief process. Yeah, you know, identity, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, and it's this constant search, right? Especially when you start going deeper into this work within yourself, right? Mm. We go deeper into this work and then realize how much we actually don't know about ourselves. Mm-hmm. So that actually is the paradox of, of this purposeful work mm. that we get to actually move beyond and recognize that things don't always have to make sense, right? Because the meaning is inherently always there. It's always existent just as God, universe, source, creator, whatever you want to use, whatever you design your life mm-hmm. around, it's all saying the same thing. Yeah. 
and it's at the level of acceptance of uh, of the things we cannot control, surrendering to a, a much larger blueprint plan. All right, mm-hmm. before we get to woo woo, because I can go woo woo with you, <laughs> and, and we get deep, uh, I want to bring it. I want to bring it back a couple layers. Let's let's go back a decade, maybe maybe fifteen years even, um, because where I believe all of us as as teachers and guides along the path, what we get to do. And we get, get to give the bite-sized pieces of where we were so we can meet people where they're at. And I share a lot about my, my Pam problem, the passive aggressive man. I've, I've talked about, you know, the former fat beard before it was the fit beard, um, all, all kinds of vices I've talked openly about, you know, drinking drugs, all that stuff. And, you know, that kind of uh, chrysalis journey where you go from craw- crawling around on the ground like a caterpillar into becoming the butterfly, you got to go through the darkness of the cocoon first. Like you got to mm-hmm. go through some darkness. If you don't mind, share with the listeners a little bit about some of your um, Nathan 1.0 version where you, <laughs> where you were crawling in the dirt and before you had transformed into this transformational alchemist and you're on this spiritual journey, spiritual counselor, counselor uh, where were you before so that we can let our listeners know that wherever they are is exactly where they need to be and there's great hope and great opportunity for them. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, 15 years back, I was 15. You know, and around that time, I was jumped into a gang. I had gotten really deep into, again, drug alcohol space, ultimately resulting uh, knee deep in heroin addiction. And crossing that threshold is a threshold that, you know, few may understand. And it's probably the darkest place that one can really get to. So coming out of that and choosing to become sober, going into the military, and choosing better for myself and realizing along the way that I was the root of all my own suffering and the root of my own chaos because I was just, no matter where I went, whether I was in a gang or the military, you know, opposite sides of the spectrum, you know, my behavior was still the same. Yeah. You know, I was still hustling and, and, you know, we'll call it like gangbanging, you know, (laughs) in a place that it wasn't really necessary. Mm -hmm. And of course I had a knack for fighting um, just being a mixed martial artist. Cause we've connected on that level too. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know how to actually or appropriately channel my anger. And that showed up through aggression, mm-hmm. right? Which was actually, again, kind of in regards to Pam, it came about in very passive aggressive ways, mm-hmm. whether it was manipulation, deception, coercion, there were a lot of different ways that it would express itself, especially in the military, because then I got a little sense of authority And Mm. then it became almost this tyrannical feature I would walk Mm. around with. So it started expressing itself in that way too. So when I got medically discharged from the military, I got medically retired, um, got really deep into fitness, right? Fitness is the thing that I bonded to because Mm. it was the most interesting experience of pleasure and (laughs) self-mutilation that I could Mm. possibly imagine. Yeah. And getting into bodybuilding too. Um, again, the steroids and the ridiculous diet and mm-hmm. along the way, womanizing along the way, manipulating, be, you know, having this chip on my shoulder that I didn't think that anyone could knock off. Mm-hmm. And as fate had it, it was a granite counter. I leaned on, snapped off, ripped my hand open, which kind of got that chip off real quick. Mm-hmm. And it was in that moment when I had lost my dominant hand, bodybuilding was over. I thought fitness was over for me. I thought life was over for me and being in that place. And this is just a little bit before we had met. It was when I recognized how badly I actually hurt on the inside Mm. because I couldn't put that stuff anywhere or couldn't use the gym as the the shrine. Yeah. Right. And, you know, being in those moments alone, that was almost as dark as heroin for me because it was almost like, withdraws but it wasn't withdraw from a substance it was withdraw from purpose it was yeah. withdraw from meaning yeah, which man. i didn't feel as though that life had any meaning in that point mm. and that's when i started stepping in and leaning into healing and and wanting to create a better life for myself what was the uh what was the root of the anger because I, I think a lot of men can really resonate with this internal rage this anger this short fuse irritation frustration annoyance and just this 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 inside furnace that they just don't know what to deal with what was the root of your anger oh i was abused 
it came back to my abuse and it also came you know because there's as we are all know when it comes to like weed networks right we see the weeds and we see all these different entanglements of roots so there were multiple roots one was being abused as a child another one was just observing my father growing up mm. another one was because i was bullied and picked on mm. and i didn't feel like i had a voice i didn't feel like i was important mm. and underneath all of that rage and anger it was just deep pain and sadness mm. yeah that's and that and i know that i could ask you that question and get uh, a very clear roadmap because of the work that you've done and that you've leaned into and why I wanted to ask that so specifically, you know, what is, what was the root of your anger? Cause you're much more peaceful now, even compared to when we first met in 2018, <laughs> like the version of where you are now and where you were, you know, I think our evolution has, has forced it because of the work that we do. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys are unable to articulate the, the, the reason for this rage and this anger inside. And it is deeply rooted in pain and hurt and trauma, physical, mental, emotional, sexual abuse. Um, the lack of feeling important, not having the the needs met as a child, and all of that just turns into this this chaos and turmoil, this um, this fire inside. That if it is not given a healthy outlet, it turns into drinking drugs and more abuse. The perpetrator or the 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 one that was just receiving it then becomes the perpetrator for causing more pain in the world. Mm -hmm. I love that. What was the the start of your so break the wrist in you know 2016, roughly around there. Um, you bust open the hand, you can no longer have this outlet. Imagine you're dealing with this ferocity inside. God is now pointing you in a different direction. What was the start of the stepping into the healing? Or what was one of your first technologies or uh, resources that was like, ah, damn, I, I'm seeing some light. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it actually came through the transformational trainings that, you know, we had actually connected in. Oh, that's so right. I, yeah. yeah. Cause yeah, I started yeah. in landmark. So I started with the landmark program landmark. Yeah. and it was that basic advanced course. And uh -huh. then I did like a communication course too. Uh -huh. And then shortly after we met, right. Cause that was during the beginning of my entrepreneurship journey. Yes. And then right after we met, we actually went through that program together with MITT. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And it was those experiences. Those were the first, what I would call like somatic experiences. Uh -huh. Um, because it was a different type of experience as we both know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, and it brought up a lot of shit. Uh -huh. You know, it, it brought up all that stuff that, you know, I carried all the shame, the stories, you know, this victimhood, this, mm -hmm. you know, persona, these masks that I would consistently wear just to appease yeah, the yeah. needs of others or mm -hmm. make it seem like I had my shit together when in reality, I wanted to blow up every fucking building I looked at. Uh -huh. And it was, it was those, right. Those yeah. experiential transformational trainings. Yes, yes. Uh, so, you know, for the listeners that are unfamiliar, so Landmark as a technology has been around for, I think, roughly like 1970s, 1960s, something like that. It, mm -hmm. it is a, uh, a series of in-person experiences that challenge your paradigm perspective and your emotional intelligence and puts you in relatively high stress situations um, that forces you to see how your limiting belief system is casting a lens, negative or positive or anything um, on life and reality. And then through the coaching experience, you get to get different perspectives. And so landmark is something that I, we both went through. Um, and then a, another one called um, mastery and transformational therapy out here in, in the Orange County area. And uh, they had three three levels of it, of course, about nine months, I think, to, to complete everything all said and done. It was, it was a pretty extensive course. Um, that I remember doing that. I was like, this, this was a massive wake up call for me. I think the same time I was like, holy, holy shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And those, those, I really like how you said it. It's, it's the kind of like shatters that paradigm, mm -hmm. you know, it's these like giant, giant paradigm shifts that just like reveal everything, everything. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that's what we see a lot in today. You know, we see yeah. a lot of different experiences and I know that you guys with, you know, MDK, like you create these like paradigm altering earth shattering experiences, mm -hmm. which show people really how they show up. Yeah. It, well, they mimic life, right? You know, life gives us those, um, Altering experiences, death, divorce, diabetes, um, you know, bankruptcy, wife leaves you, something like something that gets you out of the, the normal realm and you pay attention. Mm -hmm. And so these facilitated experiences create a safe place that allows your paradigm to be ripped apart so that you can rebuild. Because most people don't pay attention until life delivers them this beautiful opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that rock bottom serves a, uh, <laughs> a radical message. Yes. Yeah. 
Okay. So after you went through these transformational experiences and you were involved in coaching, I'm seeing uh, kind of a thread here. You, you hit a, a relative rock bottom at a second point in life and you're feeling this deep desire to reignite a purpose. You go through the experiences, you seek the guide, you seek the guides and the gurus and the part of the hero's journey. And then you start um, really getting breakthroughs by the in-person mm -hmm. stuff. What other technologies, tools were you deploying or have you been deploying over the last, last four years? Yeah, man. And I've, I've gone really deep into the metaphysical sides. Mm -hmm. So I actually went to a metaphysical healing university called Delphi. It's in Georgia. Okay. And that's actually where I was trained in mediumship. So for those who aren't familiar, it's basically what we would call psychics. So I went to psychic school and I did their transpersonal psychology mm -hmm. therapy program. And I became a Rohan therapist. I was ordained through their church. That's why I can legally practice as a, as a counselor now. And along that time, I was also introduced to multiple spiritual healing modalities. That's when I started my plant medicine journeys. Mm. Kicked that off with DMT, jumped right off the high dive, uh -huh. um, got my flesh ripped off my body, all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, went into a really unique modality called gateway heart healing. And it was from my first spiritual teacher, Katie. And it was a combination of breath work and channeling. So we would actually be channeling higher powers, higher authorities mm. in the breath work space and actually using the breath as the conduit to connect to spirit. Mm. And it was through those healings that I started really going deep into the, you know, breathwork realm. And I've been a breathwork practitioner now for about four years mm -hmm. and introducing this modality is the foundation of everything that I teach, everything that I do. And that has led me along the journey of going into integrative somatic therapy and mm -hmm. doing that training through Embody Lab among heart math and more trauma informed, trauma sensitive practices and really calling in more opportunities to step into leadership and really helping people realize that leadership is the game of life, mm -hmm. you know, and, and through that lens, applying these different modalities, we can start unlocking a lot more. And this is like a combination and blend of somatics with transpersonal psychology, which is spiritual psychology to even quantum physics, metaphysics. And then really depth psychology and internal family systems. Mm -hmm. And that's what they use in like parts work. And we can start working with the inner child. We can start looking at what Carl Jung had said, right? The archetypes. That's all the internal family systems is. It's like modern day Jungian psychoanalysis. And we can start applying these all into one. We start blending them and mixing them and matching them, which is now birthed a new intention method, Love which it. is the technology that I've created to create more of a simplified and sustainable model without all of the noise, right? And reducing that. it down to the fundamental core principles that I believe to be true, that every human being should walk with and embody every single day. Mm, I love that. And I'm, and I'm going to leave that as a, a slight curiosity piece because I want to pull on that a little bit more. Um, but what I want to hear and our listeners to hear and to simplify down to is you have sought many tools for healing, because there are many ways that we get to the, get to the root cause. And you've aggregated all of these tools for many teachers over time, because it is your intention to live a, a wholehearted healed life. And you have created your own methodology from it. Mm -hmm. Love it. Right. Gangster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, the, the, really what this summarizes is, is that there is no right way. There is no one right way. And, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, where we can get lost so much is we need one blueprint. We need one thing. I need one teacher, one person, one person's got it all figured out. The truth of the matter is if you're really on your spiritual path, your healing path, even your entrepreneurial path, any path you're on, you should be gathering data from many sources. And just like Bruce Lee says, you know, find what works for you and throw away the rest and build your own system because anything that doesn't work for somebody else. Yes, it can work for you, but you are a unique, beautiful butterfly and you need to pull from, you need to pull from all of the resources available. Exactly. And, and that's, that's where I feel like a lot of people and, um, you know, since we're, we're talking on this podcast, right. A lot of men, right. It's kind of like we are as men pretty conditioned from a very early age to seek out like this, this father figure, mm. right. This father who either wasn't present, this father who wasn't, whether it was emotionally available or physically available or whatever the case may be. Um, and there's this like deep desire 
down inside that, that wants to find this one person, this one person to yes. fulfill that need that wasn't met as a child. Yeah. So I'm going to take my umbilical cord and plug it into you. Yep. Exactly. And when we can like disconnect from that, and then we can recognize that like, oh, wow, I can actually learn from every single person that I pass. You know, mm-hmm. you can, you can learn something from somebody you walk by in a grocery store. If you have to ask yeah. them a question, yeah. right. <laughs> the collector becomes your coach at that point. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the beautiful thing about that too, with this kind of work is you realize your own internal system for being your, um, your, your guiding true North and that God lives inside us, no matter what spiritual practice you follow into, what religious practice you follow into, it is always about coming to understanding and knowing of the voice that is already inside. And Mm -hmm. that is, that is the, the greatest, um, the greatest, I think, gift from healing that you can cut through the noise and really start to trust the intuition inside, the, the new intuition, right? <laughs> I love yeah, it. Man. I love it. So tell me these uh, these core principles for, for your foundation. What are some of the core practices that you believe that everybody should embody uh, as they are walking the walk? Yeah. So a lot of the core principles, and I'll reduce a lot of this down um, because I know I can get but it really boils down to three things. And it's the soma, the psyche, the spirit, all right? And it's kind of this tertiary model that most people would call the mind, body, and the soul. Mm. And the reason why I chose the soma, psyche, spirit is because each of those have layers. And when we can recognize that we have the layers that are contained within the pillars, then we can even dilute that down further or concentrate that down further, I should say, you know, in soma and our psyche, right? The soma is our living wholeness. And that is that the quite literal translation of, of the body, right? And we have three core principles of the body. We have sensation, respiration, and expression. Mm -hmm. So if we can feel, right, sense certain things around us, whether we put our feet on the ground or step out into the sun, we take a breath of fresh air, right? We can start returning back to those natural instincts that reside deep down in, in each of us. And all of those senses contains information, which then that information we can then apply into our psyche. We can apply to those, you know, subconscious narratives or those conscious stories that we tell ourselves to get through the day and even start using them as gateways to the shadows, to the things that we can't see, to the things that we're not aware of until something like the rock bottom explodes in our face. And then we can determine energetically what's necessary. And that's kind of what I include in the spirit is energetic, energetics, power dynamics, and inner authority. So we talked about that inner intuition, that inner authority, which is the soul's expression through the body. And then we can find a sense of clarity, coherence, mm. and connection with each and every step that we take. I love that. And I, I don't want to simplify your modality, but what I hear you say, and I, just to, to grasp me because, this is, because I'm not, not that smart, uh, feel somatic experience, five senses <laughs> feel. Mm-hmm. psyche think and b is your spirit it says it's a, a process to get you to feel with all of your senses all of your ability to think on a completely new cellular level and to be the embodiment of your highest self is that right cool potent love it feel think be mm-hmm. gangster <laughs> it's super gangster though because the truth of the matter is if you ask you ask me 12 months ago eight 24 months ago definitely five years ago uh, what are you feeling? I would be able to give you anger, irritation, frustration, rage, annoyance. I'd give you all of those kind of negative vibrational feelings. And I was like, where do you right. feel those in your body? I was like, I don't know everywhere. I don't think I could get specific with where the emotions are showing up across my five senses and the effect that it's having on my thinking. I just had no correlation between this subconscious sensory experience and my thoughts. It was just this, I was just in a yuck, a yuck. Mm-hmm. I think most guys can uh, understand what the yuck feels like and they want more. They want more. They want that feeling of being on purpose, on path. They just don't know how to get there. Yeah. And even as you say that too, and this is something that um, John Wyland Mm. talks a lot about. He talks like the masculine is like awareness and the feminine is like sensation. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's kind of like, we have all these feelings, right. Emotions, especially as men. Mm -hmm. And again, we're very just mentally dominant creatures. Like that's mm-hmm. just how it's, it's a biological operating system. Yes. So a lot of men have, have really struggled with that, you know, and it's also like this, this narrative in society where it's like, Oh, if a guy 
experiences, emotions, other than, you know, the manly ones, quote unquote, manly ones, Mm -hmm. then that might inherently make him a weaker man. When in reality, it's just a lack of awareness of what's causing it. Right. Well, and I think also that, you know, the narrative needs to be changed drastically because the truth of the matter is we are designed to feel, um, just as much and expressively as our female counterparts. And if we don't feel and don't fully allow the feelings to purge and to uh, express themselves, they end up getting constipated and too much constipation over a long period of time creates septus in in the body. And that creates that feeling of rage and anger and frustration where we're using devices to numb. And next thing we know, we're dealing with our own cancer inside of our relationships and in our physicality. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, yeah, and, the, and that image that always like comes into mind, and I really like how you how you referenced it to like the septic, the toxicity, right? And then there's you know there's this thing floating around like toxic masculinity when like uh-huh. masculine is an energy, uh-huh. not so much a behavior. There are toxic behaviors, and that toxicity comes from these suppressed and repressed parts. These things yes. that aren't being able to be expressed, mostly yeah. due to a lack of or lack of perceived relative safety. Yeah. Yes. A hundred percent. I, I, right. uh, um, that has been a new word that I've been learning is safety is like what makes me feel safe. And I think mm-hmm. the reason so many triggers come up inside, even now, no matter where you are in your journey, like you're never done. And I'm, I'm starting to really, um, engage with that question is like, what makes me feel safe? What are the things that cause me to go into that fight or flight mechanic where I want to either defend and attack, or I want to avoid something. And the level of awareness recently, thank God has has really been a big part due to breath work, breath work and really understanding um, what our, what our nervous system is, is signaling us when we are feeling a sense of threat. And then being able to understand, okay, this is a physiological response. Now I need to elevate my awareness and ask the question, what about the situation or experience makes me feel unsafe that is causing this biomechanic? And uh, the the breath work though, that's been a game changer, man. Mm -hmm. Absolute game changer. I had no idea how powerful that was until I've I've, I've been teaching it, but also really been deploying it inside of my my practice just throughout the day. Mm Mm-hmm. And when you say that you're deploying it, is it a specific type? Is it, what does that look like? Great question. Yeah. I, uh, I have gone through a few, um, holotropic experiences, like long extended fast and rapid. For those of you that don't know what it is, um, it is a fast and rapid breathing pattern. It makes you hyperventilate to create a, a, a sympathetic response in your nervous system. Um, and I was introduced that about four years ago. And then some Wim Hof style breathing, as I think most of us are fairly familiar with the the Iceman. Um, And so some of those breathing mechanics, but really right now it's exploratory, uh, where I will focus on doing some fast and rapid for three to 10 minutes and then exploring with the whole, the release and the edges of the breath and then experiencing um, the, I don't know any other way to describe it, but a, a nervous system reset, like it is just a dopamine serotonin flush. Uh, it's, it's very similar to DMT. And for those of you who've done it, where you're just, mm-hmm. and it's all from your own experience and, uh, uh, literally, you know, no other, no other chemistry other than the chemistry you create inside your body. Uh, but the relief that comes out on the other end is, is substantial. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's so many benefits, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's so fascinating when I hear, you know, as a breathwork practitioner, I, I, I get really curious about, you know, people's personal practices, because like you said, it doesn't have to look any certain way, Yeah, you know, and there's, there's opportunities to ask, like, you know, what is this for? What does the facilitation look like? And, you know, what's, what's the end game, right? What's the accomplishment, right? If, if we typically have really hypervigilant nervous systems, then chances are holotropic might not be where you want to go. You know, right. maybe it's, you know, let's focus on through the nose, slow, deep, and long, and really start attuning and developing that relationship to the nervous system that would best support someone for where they're at. Mm-hmm. And I'm almost super curious. And I think it's important to mention because a lot of these, and maybe you've experienced this too, I don't know. Um, but a lot of the practices that are being taught or, or, you know, spread online, sometimes they can become overrides, Mm. you know, they can actually be used as bypasses to actually experience the difficult shit that we need to experience that our nervous system is seeking 
to complete or resolve something that mm. lived within us from the past. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So what I hear you say is that uh, someone unfamiliar with the, all the different angles of breath work might get into one of the crash courses online and it creates, um, create more distance from what the body is actually trying to heal through by right. going, if like, like you said, if they have a hypervigilant nervous system, they're already short and shallow, fast and rapid most of the time, then maybe that's not the best tool to reset. Maybe they need to get more familiar with the low, steady vagal tone breathing. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Because if, if somebody has, you know, a, a dysregulated nervous system on the daily, as I like to say, and, and it's call, causing dissociation and, you know, they're mm. constantly in a state of fight or flight, you know, it's kind of, you're already in sympathetic drive. You're already in, and for those who are listening, right. Sympathetic is like, you're in a stressed state, Yeah. right. Where parasympathetic is passive, you know, ironically speaking, <laughs> when it comes to band, right. Yeah. Um, but really it's like knowing when to introduce these, these states of passivity mm. for longevity, yeah right, because well, rest and be... relax right exactly yeah you know i think it's important to mention i i, um, I think that is a really good mention uh, where would uh where would people learn more about this uh breath work practice i mean a great book actually is the oxygen advantage mm. that's a great book to go on um and, and there's so many different types of breath work i mean you know there's box breathing there's holotropic mm -hmm. breathing there's you know, pranayama type breathing and different traditions of yoga. And again, there's no real right way. It's just recognizing it's knowing that like, simply put, right. If you breathe through the mouth and if you breathe into the chest, you're going to be sympathetic. Mm -hmm. If you breathe through the nose and you breathe in the belly, you're going to be parasympathetic. Mm -hmm. Right. So sometimes the, the practice is just consciously breathing throughout the day. Even if it looks yeah. like one minute a day, you know, just like yeah. your practice, you know, three minutes, like rapid and then see what I can do, get my O2, CO2, all those things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Love it. I love it, man. I love it. What listeners take a deep breath. <laughs> love it, man. <Well> done. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got this healing journey and you've got this new mission and vision. And you shared a little bit before we hopped on the call about this new intention ministry of creating a shared space for practitioners and healers. And uh, I want the listeners to know a little bit more about that. So if you don't mind, riff on that for a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So where where are you very, headed? Yeah, it's in very, very early stages right now. You know, I'm actually just going through, you know, what is, right, legally a designation of a ministry, more mm -hmm. specifically a training and education ministry. So I'm not really trying to build churches all over the place, right? It's, it's right, depending on what people believe church to be. Mm -hmm. Right. And I see, I see, you know, my church personally is in nature, you know, my church is anywhere I can walk and anywhere I can connect. Right. My yeah. devotion is, is daily practice, you know, daily walk. And that looks a lot different for a lot of people. So sure. really what I see for the ministry of new intention to be is yes, a space to collectively come together and to help walk each other home as we might say, mm. right. To help walk each other home in certain ways. And I explained to you before we started, it's like going to be like more of a community garden, but an actual space where people can connect, where they can receive support, where they can seek counsel, where they can, you know, sit in meditation and have their own practice for self-realization and practitioners and healers or therapists or coaches or whatever, they would have a space available that would be more accessible to the community more accessible to so that way people wouldn't have to pay obscene amounts for a venue space yeah you know and that that contributing to the surrounding community's needs you know like for instance here in phoenix right we have hopelessness we have veterans we have a lot of people who are hungry we have people going through a lot of rehabilitation transition from rehab back to you know civilian life we'll call it and, you know, each community has a specific need depending on the demographic. So big vision is, hey, can I establish these centers in every single major city across the country? And that actually gives back and restores a sense of harmony to the surrounding areas to where that can be a, a conduit for what I would consider to be harmony. 
ultimately. I love that, man. Yeah. Harmony and healing. That is uh, why I believe that we are here on this, this planet to help the other, other people find harmony inside their life and to create healing. And uh, we can't do it alone, I think is one of the coolest things that this vision for futures that you're creating is you, you recognize that the collaboration and community that you get to come together with will be far greater than anything that any one of us could do independently. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. What are you most excited about right now in your life? Hmm, that's a really good question. Thank you. I'm excited that my son's home. You know, we've been, we've been able Odin. to have him home. Yeah, Odin. Uh, we've been able to have him home now for about a month. He was in the NICU, as you know, for like 66 days. Mm -hmm. um, and then we brought him home two days after my mother had passed. So having him home has been incredibly healing. And to now be able to, like next week, uh, myself, my partner, my daughter, and Odin, we're all going to fly to Rochester, New York to see my son. So I'm going to spend a holiday mm -hmm. um, with all three of my kids. So I'm going to be there with all three of my kids. I'm going to be there with my girlfriend, my partner. And, you know, we get to, I get to have that, that sense of family. It, it, yeah, I love, I love getting together because I don't get to see my son in New York as often. So anytime I, I get with, together with them, it's really special. It's really special. It's been almost a year. So that, that has been one of the greatest thorns in my life. And also one of the most beautiful opportunities I get as a dad. Mm -hmm. As as a father, three three kiddos, what is your what is your vision and hope for the world that they will live in as mm. they grow up? The vision that I would hope for them to see really is a society where we see more love than fear. Ultimately, that that's the world that I would like to see you know, because we see a lot of stuff playing out, um, partly due to the media, mm -hmm. you know, where they just seek to trigger the shit out of people and poke people and prod people. And, you know, we see a lot of division and separation, intentional division, intentional separation happening. And, you know, biologically, we weren't designed that way. Mm -hmm. As, as humans, we were biologically designed to be tribal and communal. And, you know, we didn't really recognize fear unless it was a saber toothed tiger or whatever the hell they had back in the day chasing us down. You know, we weren't really imposing fear from within, you know, it was always coming from or without. as a marketing strategy. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And we all kind of, you know, if we're listening to this, right, chances are that you subscribe to some of this stuff. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's uh, that that's the world, you know, because I think I think that's really important. I think it's really important that especially we as men, I think it's really important that we also lead that, have mm -hmm. those conversations, um, lead by example and, and not subscribe to the fear that we face. Right. And I know you have a really cool acronym for fear, right. Um, mm -hmm. or no, it's fuck fear. Fuck fear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's your acronym for that. You know, like I would love for my kids to grow up and, and not feel scared to go to school. Yeah. I, love I would that. love that. I love that. I love that, man. I love that. All right. I'm going to pull one, two more questions from you. One more on that thread uh, of uh, living in a society where we choose love over fear. Describe what love is. <laughs> I mean, dude, love, love is the fucking cheat code, man. Yeah. You know, love is the cheat code, right? That, that is the energetic, right? We'll use this for instance. It's, it's, it's the energetic fuel that gives us meaning every day. Mm -hmm. Like really that that's the cheat code for life. That's life code right there, man. You know, it's what we, it's what we get. It's what we all inherit by design, by design from the divine. Mm -hmm. And then we get to walk with that. We get to share that and we get to express that. We get to experience that, mm -hmm. you know, when, when we choose to, it's the most yeah. empowering thing in the world. Gangster. I love that. I love that. And, and the reason I'm pulling on this thread so much, again, I want to pull, I want to paint a picture of Nathan Kohlerman over the last 15 years that if I think if uh, someone were to ask you what love is and the society and the world you want your kids to grow up in, 
and knowing the anger and the rage and the steroids and the disconnection and and all that before i want the listeners to hear how articulate and communicative you are how grounded in your masculine purpose and potential the leader that you are of not only your family of recognizing that the impact you're going to have is going to be far greater than you possibly imagine because you are choosing to I want, I want the listeners to hear that and really hear the evolution of a man on path with healing and purpose, because so many men want to subscribe to this idea that they don't express, they don't feel, they don't really have the ability to lead, they're passive in some nature, in some capacity, and they don't realize that they are truly the creators of so much beautiful life when they choose to be. And your journey, my journey... I want that to be the blueprint. I want that to be a blueprint for so many men. And so I, I honor you, man. I'm, I acknowledge you. Last question for you. Last question. Finish this sentence. A man of value is. Mm. A man of value is unwavering to his virtues and values. Gangster. Yeah. And that one can be a whole nother conversation in itself. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that's, that's, that's integrity, Mm -hmm. you know, a man of integrity. And now you think it's appropriate to share, you know, that John Wyland referring back to him again, he's a, he's one of my teachers. Um, He comes from the line of teachers of the David Dita. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he says that, you know, everyone is always out of integrity. Mm -hmm. Right. And when we can accept that we are out of integrity, we get to form a new relationship with that. And it's in that, right. We get to recommit, right. We fail. And in that failure, we get the opportunity to recommit because it is, it's commit, fail, recommit, commit, fail, recommit, fail, recommit, fail, recommit. And it's the same thing, you know, and that's actually what builds resilience. Mm -hmm. You know, it's through, like we've been talking about through both of our experiences, you know, to actually have a resilient nervous system, Mm -hmm. to have a resilient heart, to have a resilient mind, And to overcome the adversities that come into our awareness, that instead of letting them dominate us, that we are actually able to command ourselves in our sovereign body and our Mm -hmm. sovereign spirit, and then do what's right, you know, do what's right and like Mm -hmm. leave this land better for the legacy that we're leaving, you know, so that way our children can follow on our path and they can walk in our footsteps and they can be proud of those footsteps. Yes. rather than stray the path like so yes. many men have done today is stray the path from the father they had yes 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 i love that i love that legacy minded i love that brother nathan you, uh where can people find you yeah bro they can find me on every social media platform at nathan Kohlerman, and then they can go to www.newintention.com cool I know you, you've got a podcast that's dope. Um, you've mm-hmm. got events that you do, you do in-person and group coaching, you do, you do everything. And so uh, listeners, if uh, anything Nathan said resonated with you, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, do us both a favor and like it, share with a friend, tag someone that needs to hear it. Uh, we are on this mission to help men become better. And we do that by helping empower other men through this type of message. And so please do us a favor and like and share this with as many people as possible. Nathan, I appreciate, man. I'm grateful for you. I acknowledge you on your journey. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next time we collide because it's only just the beginning of all the great things that we're up to. That's right, man. Thank you again. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for the work that you're doing. Really love and appreciate you, bro. Here for it all. Appreciate it, brother. All right, my friends, much love, many blessings. We'll talk to you soon. Boom.